Welcome back. In this video, we are going to create a dynamic simulation of the gear train that we assembled in lab 4. For example, we'll try running a simulation where the input gear rotates for 10 seconds at 0.25 revolutions per second counterclockwise, as noted on the drawing. Recall that we assembled this gear train with two main sub-assemblies, one for the spur gear set and its mounting bracket, and another for the worm gear and its mounting bracket. And we brought these two sub-assemblies into our overall assembly along with the worm, spur gear, and long rod to tie everything together. We applied a bunch of assembly constraints to fully constrain our gear train model, which are summarized in this list. For instance, we applied axis-axis mate constraints between the rods and the mounting brackets, and also made the rods flush with them. We also applied the axis-axis mate constraint between the rods and the gears, and we used either a flush or a mate constraint with offset to define the positions of the gears along the rods. We also mated the origin planes of the rods with those of the gears so that the rods would spin with the gears, and the last thing we did was apply an angle constraint between the origin planes of the gears and the side face of the mounting bracket so that the gears and their rods would no longer be able to spin about their axes. Now, since we want to simulate the rotation of our gear train, we are going to have to get rid of these angle constraints so that our gears can rotate. Here I have our gear train assembly open in Inventor, and I can expand on the spur gear component in the assembly browser to delete the angle constraint applied to this gear so that it and the long rod and the worm will be able to rotate. Now we want to do the same thing for the spur gears and worm gear, but if we drop down the sub-assemblies in our browser, you'll notice that we don't see any angle constraints here, and that's because these constraints that we see are applied to the sub-assemblies overall. We have to expand the individual components within these sub-assemblies in order to see the constraints that we applied in the sub-assembly models. And you can always right-click on the sub-assembly models to open them in a new tab. So I'll do this, I'll open the worm gear sub-assembly, and I'll delete the angle constraint applied to the worm gear so that it can now move, and I'll save this update. I'll do the same thing for the spur gear subassembly, where I have to delete the angle constraints applied to these two spur gears, and I'll save this. Now our gears are free to rotate, but we want the rotation of one gear to cause the rotation of the other since they are meshed. Right now, Inventor only knows the geometry of the gears in our gear train, so we need to specify the function of the gears and how the rotation of one gear drives the rotation of another. To do so, we need to apply a motion constraint. So I'm going to just line these teeth up as best I can by eye first, and then I'll bring up the constraint tool and I'll select the motion tab instead of using the assembly tab that we've been working with so far. In this motion tab, we can define the motion relationship between components in our assembly, which could be a rotation-rotation relationship for mechanisms like spur gears, or a rotation-translation relationship for mechanisms like a rack and pinion. For our spur gears, we'll select rotation-rotation, and next we have to define the solution as reverse, where our two gear selections should rotate in opposite directions since they are meshed. Don't forget to ensure the solution option is correct for your application, the forward option would be applicable in cases like a shaft driven by a belt or chains. Then we can click on the faces of our mesh gears as our two component selections. And finally, we have to define the motion ratio between these components. Now, this is dependent on the order of your gear selections. If you selected the first gear in your gear set and then the second, you have to enter the inverse gear ratio here, like Z1 over Z2 or D1 over D2. For this gear set, we have a 24 tooth gear and then a 12 tooth gear, so we can just put 24 over 12 as our ratio and press apply. Now if we try to rotate our 24 tooth input gear, we'll see that the pinion it is meshed with will rotate as well, which is awesome. As we saw before, our gear teeth appear to interfere a little because I didn't align the teeth properly, but we won't concern ourselves with this because we can always refer back to our gear design calculations to ensure that this gear set is viable. So let's save this and go back to our overall gear train assembly. Since this main assembly is associated with the sub-assemblies, any updates we make in our sub-assemblies or any parts within them should also get updated in our main assembly, 
You might just have to click the local update button at the top window for things to refresh. But even if we do this, you'll see that when I try to rotate the input gear again, that nothing happens. It won't move. This brings up an important yet subtle note with assembly modeling in Inventor. By default, subassemblies act like rigid bodies when you place them inside an assembly. So even if motion appears in the subassembly, it won't appear in the overall assembly by default. In order to correct this, we need to right click on our subassemblies in the assembly browser and select flexible to allow the subassembly components to move based on the motion constraints and degrees of freedom from the subassembly model. So we'll make the spur and worm gear subassemblies flexible and then try dragging the gears around to confirm that they are now able to move. Now we can continue applying motion constraints to our assembly, first with the second spur gear set where the motion ratio will now be 12 over 12 or one since these two gears are identical. Again, make sure that you select the proper motion and solution type. Then we can do the motion ratio between the worm and worm gear by selecting these two components in that order and specifying a gear ratio of one over 15 since the worm has one thread and the worm gear has 15 teeth. In this case, we might have to apply the constraint and test out the motion to see if the solution direction makes sense. In this case, it looks like the reverse option is correct based on the behavior we observe testing it out. But if the worm gear was found to be turning the wrong way, we could always go back and edit our constraint to change the solution direction from reverse to forward. Now we've accomplished the first step of establishing a properly constrained assembly for simulation. I can't emphasize enough how important this is before we even enter the dynamic simulation environment. If you don't have the proper assembly and motion constraints applied to your assembly, you likely won't end up with the proper joints in the dynamic simulation environment that are needed to set up your simulation. In this case, we hopefully have everything applied correctly so we can enter the dynamic simulation environment and we'll see in the dynamic simulation browser that we have four standard revolution joints automatically generated from the rotation degrees of freedom of the rods and gears in our assembly model, which is good. These will allow us to monitor the angular velocities of each rod or gear with the output grapher. But just like we needed to apply the motion constraints to describe how the motion of two components are related, we also need to insert a few joints for this purpose as well. So I'm going to select the insert joint button in the top left of the toolbar, and you can see that there are a bunch of joint types that we could create. In this case, we need to insert rolling cylinder on cylinder joints for meshing spur gears, and it sort of shows in the little animation that we need to select the pitch circle diameters of our gears to define this type of joint. So we have to figure out how to make these pitch circle diameters visible before we can actually insert a joint. So let's cancel out of this window and figure this out. If you click on the assembly modeling tab of the project browser, you'll see all of the constraints applied to our assembly. But if you click on the modeling tab in the browser, this contains all of the feature information of components in our assembly, which includes the pitch diameter feature of gears. So we can right click on the pitch diameter feature and select visible for it to show up in our assembly model. And if you can't find the feature specifically labeled pitch diameter when you expand a gear component, it should be under the surface bodies folder as well. So I'll do this for the worm and spur gear that we placed in our assembly. And I'll go back into our subassembly files to do the same thing there and have our changes update in the main file. As I make this visible, we should be able to see the pitch circle surfaces on all of our gears. Once we do this and refresh our main assembly file for local updates, we can reopen the insert joint window and add rolling cylinder on cylinder joints to our spur gear sets by selecting the pitch circle surfaces of each component. We want to select the one rolling constraint option for this joint. If you forget to change this and leave it on the default two constraint option, you will most likely get an over-constrained error message. So watch out for that. Now we can click apply and repeat the process for our second spur gear set. 
For the worm and worm gear, we need to change the joint type to the worm gear type. As the animation shows, we select the pitch circle of our worm gear and then the pitch circle of our worm for the two components. We also have options to adjust the location of the joint origins and directions, but we'll just leave it as is. And the last thing we need to do is specify the pitch of our worm, which is a worm drive design parameter representing the linear distance that one full revolution of the thread travels on the worm. For this example, the worm pitch is specified to be 3.51 millimeters in our drawing. And since our worm and worm gear motion constraint was in the reverse direction, we need to specify this pitch as a negative value for the simulation motion to work out properly. So let's apply this join. And then if we try dragging our input gear, we should see all of our other gears rotating in response. If you try this and something doesn't look right, you can always go back and edit your motion constraints or your joints that you inserted. Now that we've got our joints in place and the motions appear to be correct, we are ready to impose motion on our input gear. So let's find the revolution joint corresponding to our input gear and its axis relative to the mounting bracket. And we'll right click and go to properties for this joint. Then we can go to the revolution degree of freedom tab and the edit imposed motion button to enable imposed motion for the velocity of this joint. And we can click on the graph icon to bring up the imposed motion window. In this example, we just want our input gear to rotate at 0.25 revolutions per second for 10 seconds. But watch out, we have to specify an angular velocity in degrees per second. So we need to convert 0.25 revolutions per second to the corresponding 90 degrees per second. Now let's press OK to all of these windows and go ahead and run our simulation. Just make sure you update the runtime to be long enough to capture our entire imposed motion, 10 seconds in this example. And you can also reduce the number of frames in the simulation for it to render faster before pressing play. And voila, our gear chain simulation runs. If the input gear rotates clockwise instead of the desired counterclockwise, we just have to go back into our construction mode and change the imposed motion from 90 degrees per second to negative 90 degrees per second, and that should fix it. Now our simulation looks good at a glance, but how can we confirm that it is correct? We can use the output grapher for this. Before I plot anything, let's do a quick gear calculation to determine what we expect for our gear speeds. The input spur gear has 24 teeth, and the next two have 12 teeth each, which is half as many corresponding to a gear ratio of one half. So we'd expect these two gears to rotate at double the speed or 180 degrees per second in opposite directions from each other. The worm has one thread and the worm gear has 15 teeth corresponding to a gear ratio of 15. So we'd expect a factor of 15 speed reduction of the worm gear and 180 degrees per second divided by 15 gives us 12 degrees per second. So these are our angular velocity expectations. Now let's go ahead and see if we are correct by plotting the velocities of our standard revolution joints that represent the rotations of our gears and their rods. We can see the values on the plot and also tabulated above. And the results match up within one decimal place, which verifies our calculations. We can export these results to Excel with all curves on one plot if we'd like, since they are all in the same units and we want to see how they're related to each other. And that wraps up the dynamic simulation steps for this gear train example. A couple reminders include this reminder on using Pack and Go to save and share your work, which you can review on your own time if needed, as well as these troubleshooting tips for dynamic simulation that we introduced in the Lab 5A video. I added a reminder on how to make pitch circle diameter surfaces visible through the modeling browser tab because it's an easy thing to forget. With that, congratulations for making it through all of the lab content from individual part modeling all the way to simulating assembly models of mechanisms.